with uh, shares going up, it's getting more and more expensive to own the means of production in your society. That's terrible. It means you're impoverished. The banks, the major ones, they already failed, uh, zombified or actually insolvent. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, March 28th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, March 28th, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. As always, if you are new to our channel or if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe. Hit the bell to be notified on new updates and give us a thumbs up. If you like what we do, we truly do appreciate your support and thank you for it. Rahim Taghizagedan is our guest today. Rahim is the director of the Academic Research Institute Scholarium in Vienna, Austria. In addition to being the foremost Austrian expert on the Austrian School of Economics, Rahim is also a trained physicist and engineer, as well as a renowned philosopher. And we are delighted to have Rahim here today as a first-time guest on SBTV. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Rahim Taghizagedan. Rahim, welcome to SBTV. How are you doing? I'm doing quite well. Thanks. Uh, good morning from Vienna. Well, we're glad that uh, you had some time for us. And um, we're excited being that it's our first time that we, we actually get to talk, even though we did meet you a few years back in the vault over in, in Singapore. So, Rahim, can you share with us your background and what got you interested in the Austrian School of Economics? Uh, I started uh, my career in the natural sciences and uh, uh, spent some time in the United States and there I discovered the Austrian School of Economics. I was studying economics and sociology as well uh, and I realized uh, somehow happened that uh, by being exposed to this tradition and going back to Austria that I was the last remaining Austrian economist or to become the last remaining Austrian economist in Austria. So studying economics in Austria at the time was uh the the heroes of the Austrian school were completely forgotten and not taught uh, so i got a luck to uh, find the best uh, remaining teachers uh was one student of hayek who is still uh, alive in germany and uh, uh, one student of uh, rothbard uh, still teaching in the us uh, hans Hermann hoppe and uh, they were more or less my mentors uh, and uh, i've been teaching now for quite a while uh, i teach at universities uh, in austria but also in germany switzerland Liechtenstein, so the whole german speaking area uh, i usually teach and lecture in german and i write in german i've written more than a dozen books uh, uh, most of them on economics but also other subjects uh, and uh, yeah uh, that's that's the way i've uh, uh, become an Austrian economist in both senses. Rahim, speaking of books, your latest book written with Ronald Stoffle is The Zero Interest Trap. Can you share with us why of all the possible topics that you could have written about, you chose zero interest rates as the topic to write with this book? Well, it was quite topical uh, in Europe at the time, and there was the discussion that uh, maybe the U.S. Fed had uh, avoided that kind of trap and fate, but then of course things turned uh, and uh, so it was the most topical thing to write about and of course as an economist you have to address the things that are worrying people and uh, well maybe I, I think, I mean you may be right in assuming it's quite late to worry once you realize that interest rates uh, reach a level of, of zero, but it's a kind of psychological a realization in particular once you reach nominal negative interest rates so a lot of people waking up uh, to the distortions of the monetary system and asking questions and that's what good economists i think are for trying to get a grip of, of what's going on in austrian economics what does zero interest rates or even negative rates imply are these natural developments uh, very, very unlikely, because in Austrian economics, we really want to understand uh, human interaction. And uh, so uh, we think that uh, uh, it must really show your preferences. Uh, so uh, interest rates are just prices. They are prices for intertemporal exchange. And uh, if you uh, do intertemporal exchange with foreigners, uh, it's very unlikely that the price would be zero. 
not only for trust reasons and uncertainty reasons, but in particular for the reason of time preference, uh, that uh, we are all mortal beings, thus uh, we prefer, of course, uh, to <laughs> remain alive and use resources while we are alive than always postponing to the future. So there's a kind of natural limitation to how low this price can fall. Uh, it's not in theory, it's not absolutely... Uh, 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 impossible to reach zero interest rates, uh, but that would be a behavior which is so much at odds with what we see as typical behavior in our days that it really makes you thinking. And, and the behavior that would be linked to zero interest rates would be if you really treat it like the, uh, the future, like the present, and a foreigner like a very close person, even like yourself. So you'd have no trouble. It would be the same for you. So there's no price differential means it's the same for you to exchange uh, resources that you have in time and to other people. So maybe it would be even a value for you to uh, uh, give resources to another person um, to use that in the present and then maybe in the future uh, turn it back to you. And uh, that's possible. And it would be something which most people would perceive as very altruistic. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's a kind of moral veneer around uh, low interest rates and uh, most uh, religions. Uh, I think, of course, they have a moral point. Uh, but then if you are an observer of reality and you see that the behavior and the preference of the people don't match that at all. It's not that long-term orientation is becoming more and more important. Altruism is becoming more and more important. It's rather the opposite. Uh, and thus we have a very good indication that something is going wrong, that this price is not uh, in accordance with the preferences of the population. And the Austrian School of Court teaches us that uh, uh, we have to look for these kind of distortions because there tend to be corrections in the very long term. That's an interesting point. How unique is the current situation, though, with zero interest rates, uh, even negative interest rates, compared to any other time in history? Uh, real uh, negative interest rates are not that unusual, uh, which just means that you can't uh, preserve your purchasing power just by holding the currency uh, available or by having a bank account. So uh, that's a quite typical situation. What is atypical? I mean, usually you have... Uh, negative real interest rates because inflation is very high. And uh, of course, we've come to learn that uh, uh, inflation is uh, the pricing of day-to-day -day products, more or less the CPI measurement. And that's now quite unique that we have low CPI measures and at the same time, negative uh, real interest rates. So even though inflation or CPI inflation is uh, very low, uh, 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 real interest rates are negative. So that's that's more unusual. Would you agree that the mainstream economics today is dominated by Keynesian economics? And why has the Austrian School of Economics not played a larger role in influencing monetary policies, influencing the Fed, influencing our politicians? Mm -hmm. Well, our Keynesians would claim that they are not at all in uh, the mainstream. Uh, it, the mainstream is quite an odd mix. Uh, and I think it's more about epistemology than really politics. And the question is, what is economics about? Uh, uh, what do people who are economists do, actually? And uh, if you look at it, it's not about predicting the future, because that empirically is more or less proven that economists are worse than rolling the dice. So it can't be that kind of predictive science. So then the question is, what are they doing? And I think they are fabricating narratives. Uh, and uh, those narratives are valuable. And I think there's nothing bad about uh, narratives being valuable. But of course, that can be abused. And it's abused in investment, of course, where the story can be more important than the sound basis of uh, your, uh, the sound base of your investment. And even more uh, dangerous that is in politics where you, there are all kinds of interest groups in need of narratives and I think that's why epistemologically you need then something that looks scientific that uses numbers that is uh, looks a bit like natural sciences has formulas in it and so on and that's why the Austrian school runs short uh, 
because it's really a qualitative approach to understand human beings in the whole complexity and diversity, and it doesn't lend itself that easily to quantification. Uh, of course, the Austrian economists were good, really good in maths. I was originally a natural uh, scientist, uh, uh, so there's nothing against formulas, but we know when to use them, and we know when to use data, and we know how misleading it can be, in particular if the narrative is chosen before you look for the data and the formulas. Is this something the Fed needs to really learn? I mean, they are so uh, inherently studious academics looking at their books and numbers, yet they seem to miss the, the people part of the equation. Yeah, um, I, I think they are bright people, and I don't think that they're necessarily evil uh, people. Uh, I think it's really part of this kind of specialization uh, where you try to solve riddles, interesting riddles, and uh, economics is really a bad uh, uh, branch because it's not a branch at all. It's so overarching. Uh, it's really the exchange between human beings and it, encompass, it encompasses so much of our existence, uh, in particular in modern uh, globally integrated societies. So it would be very odd to treat it the same as solving a particular riddle in a particular discipline or field you're an expert in. Uh, it really doesn't work that well in economics. You know, in today's economic landscape where there's so many ridiculous developments such as zero or negative interest rates, endless money printing to bail out the markets, government manipulated official inflation rates, record levels of debt, and we can go on and on and on. Should people still save money? And does it even make sense given these crazy developments that are stacked against savers? Yeah, I, I think it's a natural tendency of people to save. And I think it's a sound tendency. Uh, and the natural way of saving will always be the simplest one. And that's hoarding or stacking or not spending everything you have at hand. And then, uh, of course, keeping it for an uncertain future. Uh, and that has become almost impossible using uh, money uh, either in cash or bank accounts uh, uh, because there's been a fight against the hoarder. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, 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 the narratives of economics uh, are really suitable for that. Uh, uh, and uh, if you fight something in human nature, usually you cannot eradicate it. It just finds new venues and valves to express itself and it leads to distortions in the long run. So I think what has happened is you uh, partly demonetize uh, the kind of money that has this network effect of being the medium exchange, the medium of exchange that people know and use every day. And I think that's the strongest point for it. That's why we still use it. Uh, it's really a strong network effect, uh, but it has been gradually demonetized in its function. Um, and I think it's an important function. And I think you can negate it even if you don't like it, even if you think a better kind of interaction wouldn't need that function that much. Um, the Austrian school really looks at uh, the demand for things going back to the preferences, the subjective preferences of the people. So the demand for money is linked to an uh, estimation of uncertainty. It's because we feel and know that the future is uncertain, we have this demand for money. So if you strip away the function of money fulfilling um, this role uh, to provide for uncertainty, uh, and uncertainty means you can't invest everything uh, at once because you've got to figure out something. Uh, you can't spend everything at once because you figure out something. You will probably, and everyone knows we age, so we'll figure out that we'll have more needs uh, more difficult uh, or needs more difficult to fulfill in the future. That's uh, for this uncertainty we have to prepare. So if you demonetize money this way, other things will be monetized and other assets will assume that role. Uh, and that's what's happening. And some of those assets are really bad substitutes. For example, real estate is something that everyone needs. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, it's been monetized to a large extent, meaning, it, meaning it's become more and more expensive to just have shelter for yourself and your family, in particular in the areas where you're getting a job to pay uh, for the housing and, and, and live. You need to live there uh, because you want to have the job. Uh, uh, and uh, the same holds for other things. I mean, with uh, shares going up, you can look at it from the point of the share invest and be happy. But from the point of the, uh, the people, it's like it's getting more and more expensive to own 
the means of production in your society. That's terrible. It means you're impoverished. Uh, um, and of course, a lot of the political polarization, this increasing inequality and the feeling of more and more people to be left out and uh, uh, somehow lose out uh, on this uh, fantastic wealth creation that's become possible to the integration of global markets. Uh, I think that's all comes down to that fact that uh, we haven't allowed money to fulfill its roles and uh, thus other things uh, have been used as substitutes which are less usable um, uh, for, for that function. You know, during this time of the pandemic in Austria, in Germany, or even throughout Europe, are savers being more encouraged to, to save or to spend? Of course, every encouragement goes uh, into spending, more or less. Uh, uh, you can say spending an investment, but that's a bit naive because uh, investment is entrepreneurial. Uh, spending is something that everyone has to do and everyone knows how to do. Uh, investing uh, is really something more entrepreneurial. Uh, it's nothing more morally superior, I'd say, but it's much more challenging. Uh, thus, it won't really help. Uh, it's like telling uh, someone, oh, you can't get a job, become an entrepreneur. It's like, uh, oh, you can't save, become an investor. Uh, it tends to be a bit cynical, even though, of course, if you uh, have the time and interest, and I think you have a moral obligation to uh, inform yourself and try to become an investor, uh, and I think it's great if you manage to. I think it's part of adult life to think about investing, uh, but people are really pushed uh, into uh, investments. They haven't got a grip of understanding and they just want to fulfill that basic role of hoarding. So they start hoarding assets uh, instead of taking real on entrepreneurial risks uh, in investing, maybe even taking contrarian investments. But in investment usually just means buy the bonds and uh, uh, shares that your bank manager uh, will recommend to you if you are... Uh, that's uh, risk friendly to invest. Uh, most people in Europe e don't even do that. Uh, so they're even worse off. Um, uh, and uh, that's, I think, is terrible. So the whole situation is stacked against the long term saver who is not investing in assets, in particular, not in productive assets, but it's just doing the instinctively simplest way to provide for old age, which is not working at all. Uh, and that's it's like a big scam, I'd say. It's a big scam of uh, simple, hardworking, thrifty people who don't have the maybe the, the mind power and, and capacity and time to really solve that riddle of investing that is nowadays. Uh, and even, uh, even the biggest experts, of course, <laughs> fail uh, uh, because in investment, you tend to look for economists and that's, of course, the worst advice you can take. Uh, so it's really hard to figure that out. You know, I remember when negative interest rates were first mentioned by the ECB several years ago and that the central bank assured people that negative rates would mainly apply to European nations and institutional money. And retail investors or retail customers would not be affected. Today, we have news that German banks are charging higher fees and turning customer deposits away due to negative rates that are imposed on them by the ECB. How prevalent are negative rates for the man on the street in Europe today? And do negative rates have an impact on them? Uh, banks are reluctant to pass on those negative interest rates, of course. And uh, uh, it's more or less the way that they get rid of uh, depositors. They figure out they don't really need deposits. That's not the scarce thing. The scarce thing for banks is good collaterals. Uh, so they are pushed a lot by the central bank policy to just uh, increase uh, uh, the outstanding credit, but that's limited not by the amount of deposits, but uh, is that limited by the amount of good collaterals available. Uh, and uh, banks are reluctant because there's, of course, a psychological thing. So to have real nominal, so they do it as much as possible by fees, calling it fees. Uh, and uh, they do it as much as possible by limiting amounts uh, that you can have on your account and then really pushing you into assets. Uh, uh, so if you have uh, more than a few 10,000 euros on your bank account, you're... Uh, 
uh, bank manager will call you and speak to talk to you and really insist that you should think about uh, going for assets. Of course, the safest one in particular, which are government bonds uh, uh, or the bank uh, uh, or the, 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 uh, the funds featured by the bank, where the bank, of course, makes some money by recommending certain funds. Uh, and uh, so that's more or less how they try to cope with the situation. Um, uh, the problem is that in particular in Germany, uh, there's uh, quite a strong trend uh, of uh, middle class investors to, of course, then they are pushed not into assets they perceive as risky and uh, that even applies to government uh, bonds uh, for them. And they would go for the assets perceived as safe, like gold, uh, uh, even silver as uh, popular and cash. So they just start holding cash in, in uh, safe uh, boxes. Uh, and uh, that, of course, is an issue uh, uh, to, to pass on negative interest rates. You'd really need to get rid of cash first uh, uh, if you don't want to have that withdrawal effect, yeah? which maybe is not that important because banks are changing their role more or less. Uh, uh, but it would... Uh, uh, I think uh, politicians and bankers fear the psychological impact of um, more and more people withdrawing deposits uh, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe then not just withdrawing up to the limit, but uh, totally withdrawing, just leaving a little bit on the current account, but totally withdrawing from savings account and so on. Uh, because then, of course, uh, that could mean uh, capital flight. It could mean that they go out of the controlled assets uh, and it could be going abroad, uh, but it could be going into international assets like precious metals, um, cryptocurrencies, uh, uh, and so on. Okay, we'll touch on those a bit in a bit, uh, precious metals, cryptocurrencies, but cash. Do negative interest rates somehow show that European banks are now flushed with cash from the ECB and they're having problems trying to lend that cash into the economy. Yes, well, definitely. That's what I meant by good collaterals are uh, scarce. Uh, of course, in a situation like that, we're still in the pandemic, uh, lots of restrictions. Uh, it's not really the time to take out the credit uh, unless you really have to. And uh, that's where our welfare state, usually in, in, in the rich uh, uh, countries, comes in. Uh, uh, so there's not a lot of expansion of business, uh, not a lot uh, uh, of the safest collaterals. I mean, real estate is already, I think, uh, everyone who can get a loan for real estate has already taken one. Uh, and of course, real estate is still considered a, a quite good collateral and the safest collateral. But uh, what happens once we have the correction in retail real estate, which must happen because we've pushed uh, so much by using the welfare state, we've pushed insolvencies uh, into the future and a lot of retail businesses will not survive those long-term restrictions uh, in large parts of Europe. Uh, uh, so I think there can be even some, some uh, real estate uh, shocks or perceived uh, instability and uh, liquidity issues arising. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, that will be terrible because the safest collateral more or less uh, uh, loses uh, even its, its safety. And then there's only one other collateral which is propped up and that's bonds. Uh, and uh, I think they're really directly propped up by central banks and uh, uh, more or less the central banks have become the dealers of last resort, the dealers in those kind of government bonds. So we see an integration of central banks and treasuries more or less. And we've seen it in Europe uh, and we've seen it in the US. Uh, and the odd thing is the uh, development is so similar, even though institutionally they are so different. Uh, and the uh, ECB was set up and, and fairly recently, I'd say, so it's, uh, it's a modern development. And it was, it was set up with that problem in mind uh, to really separate the national treasuries from uh, the monetary policy but of course uh, political pressures and economic pressures uh, and, and the whole game that leads into this kind of zero interest trap that's why it's a trap it's like uh, it's a slide you slide towards it and it seems like there's no alternative uh, uh, to that uh, uh, and uh, more and more people are now choking in germany that the, the phrase there is no alternative uh 
has become so ubiquitous. Uh, you hear it almost everywhere uh, because politicians are fairly similar, no matter what party they are from. And it's all kind of like we can't really do anything else. It's in pandemic policy, it's in monetary policies, economic policy, it's in immigration policy, and so on and so on, uh, all without alternative. Yeah, politicians are the same no, no matter what. And I think I'm going to have to expand that to even central bankers. European Central Bank, we had Mario Draghi, whatever it takes. And now we have Christine Lagarde, who has just got her finger stuck on automatic on that printing press. Is there a brewing banking crisis growing in Europe today? And how strong are European banks? Uh, they are not strong at all, I'd say. So even the major ones really have issues. So from a business side of you, I'd say they already failed. Uh, uh, zombified or <laughs> it means actually insolvent businesses their main businesses are not working and the remainder of it I think will be eaten away pretty soon by the emerging world of fintech uh, uh, and being more creative in using collaterals I think precious metals will play a more important role as collaterals I think we are seeing a huge market uh, appear in crypto collaterals uh, and a lot of uh, old banking functions and now even the credit part is taking over by newer fintechs uh, so the business side uh, uh, is a lot under pressure but then the question of course is are banks still businesses and they are very particular kind of business they are protected business it's a cartel uh, and i think in the long run they'll just become uh, some kind of distribution daughters of the monetary authorities uh, because, of course, you only have a banking crisis if uh, the central bank does not uh, become the bad bank and uh, more or less taking over either uh, inserting liquidity into banks that need it as they need it or the state or the treasury nationalizing banks. Uh, to become daughters of the treasury. So daughters of the treasury and daughters of the central bank, I think is will become more or less the same thing. Uh, and it's all due to the monetization of government debt. Uh, uh, and that's all where the modern monetary theory leads. Uh, uh, so I think then the question is what kind of business are banks anyway? Still, it could mean that some banks which are neither nationalized, neither considered as too big to fail and relevant, could have very hard times ahead. Uh, uh, and even some shutting down uh, or becoming insolvent. Rahim, do you foresee that central banks will continue to print money and they will only stop when forced to hike interest rates like what Paul Volcker had to do back in back in the 80s to subdue the inflation? Uh, yes. Um, well, the question is, what, what are they printing? They are printing base money and, of course, the figure of speech. Uh, uh, and that is not really working. Uh, even a central banker would agree that this kind of like, just base money creation is not working. That's why we have quantitative easing, which is directly purchasing assets uh, with the created liquidity. And all, that is not working neither uh, in the sense that uh, really important broad money that reflects economic development and expansion, uh, created finance expansion of pro future productivity is not happening. Uh, and... Uh, you can really solve that by central bank policy or anything resembling classical central bank policy. Uh, that's why there's a push towards, uh, um, I'd say, fiscal policy and economic policy and so on. So the central bank really becoming more or less the, uh, the lending arm uh, for a whole lot of uh, more close to government uh, uh, related uh, agencies of intervention and uh, to provide the stimulus uh, that's needed to where it's needed uh, uh, and so on. Uh, so central bank policy as it is, uh, uh, is already in a trap. Uh, and uh, I don't think you can say it's like the central banks are creating uh, uh, printing money exponentially, thus we'll have hyperinflation pretty soon. It's not as simple as that. Uh, it's really a problem that the broad money could shrink uh, and it's stagnant. Uh, and in particular in Europe, if the pandemic situation doesn't end soon, and it's even prolonged now due to the vaccinations disasters and so on. Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, it could be that we have deflation in the sense that the broad money supply is going down for a while. And that, of course, 
uh, would have shock effects. And, and then, of course, it will bolster even more inflationary uh, politics. Uh, but it can't be sure as like a direct line uh, going to hyperinflation uh, in euro. I don't think that's that likely. I think we'll see higher volatility and that could mean uh, uh, sudden corrections. And then, uh, of course, everything, all it takes, uh, uh, but this all it takes is not so much central banks, but central bank finance, direct political intervention uh, in markets and uh, uh, infrastructure, welfare, financing, uh, the Green Deal uh, that uh, Lagarde likes to talk uh, about, uh, and so on, all kind of fiat projects uh, to get the money to people and somehow uh, yeah, provide the, the illusion of growth. Is anchoring our currencies back to gold once again the answer for our economic troubles today? Well, an answer is difficult to say if it's an answer. Uh, it's impossible if you see it as an answer as a policy proposal for a central banker nowadays, impossible. Uh, uh, as a market discovery of functions of money, yes. And I think that we are seeing already that gold is playing a larger role. Uh, it's not that much reflected in the price. We've seen it playing a larger role in geopolitics with uh, uh, countries increasing their gold reserves strategically because, uh, uh, and it's all about the relation to the geopolitical power of, of the US and the dollar. Uh, and we've seen, of course, we see still in, in, in Germany and, and other parts of the world, uh, uh, stable and quite large demand for gold uh, and precious metals in general. They are very prominent assets, I'd say. So if you ask people on the streets to rank assets, uh, uh, precious metals are much higher ranked than it would seem according to the, the price and relative importance that's uh, accorded to them by economists and data and so on. Um, so uh, I, I don't see it as realistic that gold really becomes a medium of exchange or something gold linked to replace uh, uh, directly uh, as a medium of exchange, but fulfilling gradually more and more of these roles. And I think there's huge potential for gold and precious metals playing a stronger role as collateral. If there's really a problem with banking and the credit provision by banks and so on, and it becomes more or less a political decision, who is financed, uh, then uh, people will look for alternative uh, uh, financing and collaterals. Uh, and I, I think precious metals uh, can play a role there. And even uh, geopolitically, I think it's uh, uh, quite likely that if any other part of the world wants to challenge the dollar as the world currency, uh, that precious metals would have to play a role in order to gain trust uh, for an international medium of exchange. Uh, uh, so I, I don't think it would be directly linked, but I could imagine as being part of a basket uh, uh, for a kind of uh, uh, basket packed money as Hayek has proposed it in some of his writings. Uh, so all that is possible, but nothing direct as, as a solution and answer by a central bank uh, as they are today and that ga gaining any political traction anywhere. And we know throughout history, fiat money just about always fails. Has there been any time in history where gold has failed as money? Oh, wow, that's a, a good question. I mean, it hasn't really failed in its role to uh, keep stability of purchasing power in the very long run. Of course, in the short run, it fails there as well because you have volatility in prices and gold is a commodity and it's traded on markets and markets are distorted. Uh, uh, but also market participants can have different anticipations of the future. Uh, uh, if uh, gold could have been the, it could have been the base, yes, I, uh, so it's hard to say that it has failed because it wasn't a failure of precious metals uh, in banking. It was really a political uh, interest. Uh, uh, and the main interest was that you can't finance wars and those kind of extreme wars we had in Europe. It's impossible to finance that kind of war if you all your production more or less uh, stand still uh, for war production. So there's nothing, no one really to tax left and you can't finance this by taxes and you can't finance it based on international credit. Uh, uh, then you play these kind of games and that's really where a gold, gold standard was abandoned. Uh, uh, and then later on, of course, it's all related uh, to war and geopolitical considerations uh, uh, and trying to get a free run. Um, 
So I wouldn't say it's a sign of failure. Uh, uh, only if you have to take a very political kind of view, then you'd say uh, maybe some kind of failure to reach those ends. Okay. Well, I guess if they had kept uh, gold back in the money, maybe we might have a little bit more peace in the world. Rahim, before we wrap up, could you tell us more about your work with Scholarium? Uh, yeah, that's uh, mostly in, in, in German, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, for the listeners. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's meant to be what the university could have been and was not allowed to be uh, in the end, uh, because uh, universities, of course, have uh, uh, turned into uh, quite fiat institutions as well, with a huge inflation of certifications, more or less uh, uh, providing uh, academics for uh, positions within the state and uh, positions legitimizing uh, political narratives and so on, in particular in the social sciences. So the really bad incentives that work there, uh, what we try to do is to bring back the spirit of the Austrian school as it lived not at the university at the time, but in the Mises circle, which was a private gathering, interdisciplinary gathering of, of the brightest mind of their time, uh, in very different fields and not just in theory, but in practice. So you had the leading bankers, investors, entrepreneurs meeting up with economists, philosophers, uh, political scientists. Uh, and it's really this kind of, of, of spirited uh, exchange and trying to understand what's going on uh, without being too much focused on theory and not just being in, in practice, but having this overarching view. That's what we try to do. We have study programs going on. We have very bright students uh, at the Scholarium, but uh, that's all in the German language. Uh, my more English uh, language focused work is for the Pre Free Private Cities Foundation in Switzerland. I'm a director there. Uh, and that's of course the focus about uh, creating free private cities uh, in the future. I think from a European perspective, uh, really that's crucial. Uh, the question is how can this heritage survive? Uh, uh, and I think it's very much of a European heritage that I think lives forth in places like Singapore in particular. Uh, I think the whole creation and success story of Singapore is closely linked to this, uh, to, to the aspects that made Europe great uh, at the time that it was great and it's still living off that capital. Uh, so that's something I'm passionate about to try to bring those alternative uh, uh, ideas uh, and, and, and uh, concepts, you know, from economics to the political field, but not as top-down solutions, but a kind of discovery process. and. Uh, leaving space for innovation, uh, in particular uh, in the fields of government, investment, finance, uh, technology, uh, and so on. Rahim, do you have websites where people can go and, and see your work? And do you have a Twitter handle where people can follow you? Yeah, the Twitter handle is colarium underscore AT, uh, a website where most of the English language books uh, can be for, uh, found is mises.at. Uh, uh, AT for Austria, Mises for Ludwig von Mises, uh, the great economist, uh, uh, and then for everyone who reads German, that's colarium.at uh, for that work there. And the free private cities, uh, org uh, is the Free Private Cities Foundation. Okay, Rahim Takizagadan, we appreciate the time you've given us. I hope I pronounced your name right, and I hope to see you again in Singapore sometime soon. Definitely. It was great talking to you. Bye-bye. That was Rahim Takisagadan, Director of the Academic Research Institute Scholarium, sharing with us about the zero and negative interest rate trap. To learn more, please visit scholarium.at. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on new content. And do also check out the SBTV podcast on iTunes and Spotify.